the winning, winning blueprint, blueprint presents. Draft Zone. Welcome to the Draft Zone. I'm your host, Lou. Thank you for joining me. This is the NFL Draft Game. Here with the Buffalo Bills. What the draft game is, is a look back at draft history of the first round only. You look at a particular team, in this case the Buffalo Bills, and you break down prior draft history of the Bills, and we're only looking at a 13-year span from years 2000 to the present. You look at Bills draft history in the first round, and also at the number eight selection where the Bills will be making their first round selection in the 2013 draft. We'll look at the history of the number eight selection from years 2000 to the present, see how those grade out will be using a baseball grading scale, meaning single, double, triple, home run, or a strikeout for each player drafted by the Bills and in the eight slot in the first round. So let's look at the number eight pick in the first round, here's a comprehensive spreadsheet that I've put together with every single first round pick over the last 13 seasons on it. And I'll be using this to dissect the number eight selection in the draft over the last 13 years. So let's start with the year 2000. And in 2000, the number eight selection was Plaxico Burris, the receiver out of Michigan State. Drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Solid career to this point. Had a mishap with the gunfire going to prison. It set him back a long way. So his career probably should be a triple at this point, but it's not. It's a double because of his mishaps off the field. Plaxico Burris is a double. You look at 2001. David Terrell, wide receiver out of Michigan, drafted by the Chicago Bears. Never amounted to anything in the National Football League. He was a huge disappointment. Hence, he is a strike out at 2001. You look at 2002. Roy Williams, safety out of Oklahoma, drafted by the Dallas Cowboys. He was solid. Nothing earth-shattering. He was a big hitter. But to me, he's more known for dragging people down by the horse collar. He was the main culprit behind the horse collar tackling rule in the National Football League. That's what I see Roy Williams as. A guy that was never fast enough to keep up with uh, receivers, tight ends, and needed to catch them from behind and drag them down by their horse collar. I remember him injuring guys, mainly T.O., in the season where the Eagles went to the playoffs, to the Super Bowl, and th that's Roy Williams in a nutshell. Solid, never great, double. For Roy Williams in 2002. Look at 2003. Tackle for the Carolina Panthers. Jordan Gross. He's been really solid for the Carolina Panthers. Over the years. And. I. I, I struggle with this one. Because right now I have him down as a double. But. The longevity aspect for me. The consistency from Jordan Gross. At the left tackle position. I'm changing it to a triple because the longevity coupled with the consistency, I just think that's worth something. And so it's a triple for Jordan Gross in 2003. Look at 2004, and it's D'Angelo Hall drafted out of Virginia Tech by the Atlanta Falcons. Solid pickup, burst onto the scene with a bang 
played really well for the Atlanta Falcons in stretches. But again, another one of these corners that has the potential to be great, but never really tapped fully into every ounce of potential that they had. And so you get mixed results with D'Angelo Hall. One second, he's picking off a pass and off to the races the other way. The next, he's gambling on a pass, missing, and giving up a 75-yard touchdown pass. You really don't know what you're getting from D'Angelo Hall from play to play, but he's been a really solid corner throughout his career. Hence, D'Angelo Hall is a double. You look at 2005. Eighth overall selection goes to the Arizona Cardinals. They take that selection and draft Antrell Roll out of the University of Miami. Solid safety in his league. Drafted to be a corner. Cardinals realize quickly that, hey, this guy is not made to be a corner. Let's move him to safety. They do. It pans out. It works as a very good move for the Arizona Cardinals. He ends up playing with the Giants, winning a Super Bowl. I think Antrell Roll is a really good safety in this league. He's a double. You look at 2006, Dante Whitner. With the Bills, he's a tackling machine, and not afraid to stick his nose in there, make a hard, solid tackle on a ball carrier or receiver. Like Dante Whitner a lot. Think that in Buffalo, he was really overshadowed by the lack of success in Buffalo, moved on to San Francisco, and has fit in really well with the 49ers, has played really well, made the Pro Bowl for the first time in his career in 2012, and I think that Dante Whitner has been a solid player in the National Football League. Therefore, he's a double. You look at 2007, Jamal Anderson. Ugh. Yuck. And any other sound effect you want to use to describe funk on a whole new level, that's Jamal Anderson and his play thus far in his career in the National Football League. Not hard to see why the Atlanta Falcons did not re-sign him when his rookie deal was up. Jamal Anderson is an absolute, unequivocal strikeout in this league to this point. You look at 2008, Derek Harvey. Back-to-back -back strikeouts in the draft in consecutive years at the number 8 selection. You get Jamal Anderson in 07 and 08. It's Derek Harvey, the underachieving defensive end out of Florida, drafted by the Jacksonville Jaguars. Has never, ever amounted to anything in the National Football League. A big mistake on the part of the Jaguars. You got to move on. But yes, the outside corner was painted with a beautiful pitch. Harvey did not offer. It's another strikeout. You look at 2009. Jaguars go back to the well again with the eighth overall selection. This time, they hit a solid double with the tackle Eugene Monroe. They needed this one. They couldn't afford to strike out again. Jaguars get a solid tackle. Eugene Monroe has been a really solid player in his league, and that's why he is a double. You look at 2010, Rolando McClain. Rolo. Strikeout. <laughs> He's been a head case off the field. He's been somewhat productive on it when he's been on it. Problem is, hasn't been enough. And it hasn't been what the Raiders thought they were getting. Again, I don't want to put all of the blame squarely on the shoulders of Rolando McClain here. The Raiders, again, drafted out of position. Here was a guy that was a middle linebacker in a 3-4 defense at Alabama. You take him out of that element and you stick him in the middle of a 4-3 defense. It is not the same. Rolando McClain is not as athletic as you would like your middle linebacker to be in a 4-3 defense. Hence, he struggled mightily at times. He's not good in space. And so you need to hide him in a 3-4 defense in the middle. If you're going to use him, that's the capacity in which Rolando McClain thrives. And the Raiders didn't give him that environment. They didn't put him in an environment to succeed. Thus, Rolando McClain is a strikeout. You look at 2011. Jake Locker is your eighth overall selection. 
Jury's still out on Jake Locker. So he's a single. He could easily be a strikeout, but he's not. And I don't like to give strikeout designations to players that are in their second season, especially quarterbacks. They need a learning curve. They need time to progress and mature. Not everyone has the light bulb come on at the same time. And that's for any position in the National Football League, especially the quarterback position. So Jake Locker, in my estimation right now, is a single. And I think he has some talent. He just has to be more consistent. Let's see what he is able to do in the 2013 season. But right now, he's a single. Look at 2012, Ryan Tannehill. Again, another quarterback at the eight slot in the draft. This one looks to have a brighter future than Jake Locker. But you can't really say. You can't really say. Even though it looks like that on the surface, looks like Ryan Tannehill gets it. The Dolphins feel really good that they found the air pair to Dan Marino after about 15 years worth of searching. They feel like they found someone that can fill those shoes somewhat. Ryan Tannehill stepped in, played well, gave the Dolphins hope. Now they've surrounded him with talent. Let's see what Ryan Tannehill does. But I feel like his rookie campaign was a success. Moderately, a double for Ryan Tannehill to this point. And that is your number eight selection for the last 13 seasons. It all grades out to a single. A lot of bad picks in the mix, Rolando McClain was a bad selection. So was Derek Harvey and Jamal Anderson and David Terrell. So a lot of strikeouts here really brought this average down. There are some really good players here too, but there were no triples. There were no homers. And so you only get solid to okay players here or worse, strikeouts. It's the job of the Buffalo Bills to not fall into that trap. Let's look at the Buffalo Bills and their draft history over the last 13 years, starting with the year 2000. So you look at 2000, defensive end Eric Flowers, drafted by the Bills in 2000. Not a good selection. Only played about three or four years in the league. Never did anything. He's a strikeout. You look at 2001, Nate Clements. Look. He's as solid as it gets at the cornerback position over the last decade and some change. He got that big contract in San Francisco when he left Buffalo. Was it deserved? I don't know. I, look, I'm not one to gripe about other people's money. But I will say this. When he was in Buffalo, him and Antoine Winfield forged one of the best corner tandems in the league. And they were really solid. I thought the Bills should have made a better and more concerted effort to hold on to both of those guys. As you can see, someone was willing to pay Clements an inordinate amount of money. So I guess the Bills felt like if you're going to get paid that much money, you can walk. He's been really good in this league. He's a triple to this point. You look at 2002, Mike Williams, offensive tackle out of Texas, strikeout. Weight problems, consistency issues, never matured into the player that the Bills thought they were getting with a very high draft pick in the 2002 draft. This was an utter disappointment on every level imaginable, and Mike Williams is an absolute strikeout in this league. Look at Willis McGahey. Had a gruesome injury coming out of college at the University of Miami. It looked ugly. A lot of teams opted to pass on Willis McGahee because of that injury. Bills took a chance on him. They were rewarded with a really solid player in his time in Buffalo. I actually thought that he got better after he left Buffalo, however. And it's strange how that always seems to happen. The Bills seem to give up on players a little bit too soon. McGahee went to Baltimore. I thought he was solid there. I thought he played his best football of his career in Denver. To this point, and so it's amazing in itself that as he got older, his game actually got better. And normally, that's the opposite for running backs. As they get older, their game starts to decline. Well, his actually got better. Either way, Willis McGahee is a double in this league and a player that the Bills, I thought, gave up on too soon. You look at 2004. The Bills double dipped in the first round. They took Lee Evans early on in the first round. They get a single out of him. And if Lee Evans' production has you thinking that he's a double, that drop in Baltimore that would have sent them to the Super Bowl 
against the Patriots in the AFC Championship game is enough to knock him down one rung to a single by itself. And so, if for no other reason, Lee Evans is a single. You look at the other first-round selection in 2004, it's J.P. Lossman. And that was a lost cause for the Buffalo Bills. Lossman never proved to be anything other than a backup in this league, and he really didn't even prove to be that. J.P. Lossman was an absolute mistake. You roll the dice, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. In this case, Bills lost, man. Strikeout for J.P. Lost, man. So you look at 2005. No first-round pick for the Bills. They traded that pick. So, no first round pick for the Bills. You look at 2006. The Bills chose to double dip again in the draft. This time selecting safety Dante Whitner out of Ohio State. He's been a double. We've talked about Whitner already. And again, another player that the Bills gave up on too soon. Was he a stellar safety? Did he stand out as one of the best safeties in the league? No, but was he a guy that should still be a Buffalo Bill? Yes. You look at John McCargo. John Mahu? Yeah, John McCargo. As in John McCar, no. Strikeout. Bills took this defensive tackle. He did not play well. Flamed out of the league in an instant. He spontaneously combusted his way out of the league. And before you could blink, John McCargo was a no-go in Buffalo. Wow, that sounded really good. Anyway, so you get a strikeout on one end and you get a double on the other in the form of Dante Whitner. But neither one is a Buffalo Bill any longer. Go figure. You look at 2007, another double, another running back, this time beast mode, Marshawn Lynch. Another Buffalo Bill running back that maybe wasn't up to the standards that you were looking for at the time, but you could see that the potential was there. Bills didn't wait around long enough for Marshawn Lynch to get his act together. He had some off-the-field issues as well that kind of led the Bills in a different direction. He goes to Seattle where he links up with Pete Carroll, a fellow Pac-10 alum. And Marshawn Lynch essentially has his career explode. We all know about the beast quake run in the postseason against the New Orleans Saints that really put him on the map. Marshawn Lynch is a double, borderline triple, if not for some of the inconsistencies in the middle of his career. We're talking about a bona fide triple. One more thousand yard season for Marshawn Lynch and he'll be a triple because he's had seven years in the league. Four of them have been well over a thousand one more to that list, and I say he's a triple. The Buffalo Bills swing the bat with Marshawn Lynch, get a double, tried to stretch it out to a triple, were gunned at third base. He's no longer a Bill, now a Seattle Seahawks, yet he's still a double. You look at 2008, the oldest McKelvin. And I never understood this pick in the first place. Leo's McKelvin was never a great corner at Troy when you drafted him. He was an exceptional return man, however, which is essentially what you got out of him when you got him to the league. And I think, which is why he's still a Buffalo Bill, I think you learn from past mistakes allowing guys to walk away. And so you re-signed Leotis McKelvin. But of all the Bills that I just named that should still be in Buffalo, he's the one that you could have allowed to walk away. Now, I love Leotis McKelvin and what he brings in the return game, but you really don't get a lot of value at the cornerback position which is what you drafted him to be in the first place. And so kind of conflicted and some mixed emotions with Leotis McKelvin, but he's a single in my estimation because you're only really getting value at the return aspect of Leotis McKelvin's game. You're not really getting a lot out of him at the cornerback position. You look at 2009. <sighs> Buffalo Bills fans, cover your ears, close your eyes. Your first round selection, or first of your two first round selections in 09, Aaron Maven. Yikes. I, I, I would venture to say 
at the defensive end position, he might be one of the biggest draft busts ever. I mean, this guy did nothing with the Buffalo Bills. Now, he went on to the Jets and tried to make something of his career. It did not work. But what happened with Aaron Maven? That's the real question. What happened? Where did this thing go wrong? Was it in the evaluation process coming out of Penn State? Was it the coaching staff didn't coach him up well enough? Was it his work ethic? Was his lack of ability to get it done at the next level? What was it? Where did this go wrong? Because he never materialized, but it seemed like it wasn't even pursued to its fullest extent. It seemed like the Bills just realized this guy's a lost cause and cut ties with him. I mean, we're talking about a 2009 draftee. He wasn't on the Bills roster in 2011. So... I mean, something went wrong, terribly wrong, in a two-year span in Buffalo that landed Aaron Maben off the Bills roster. Whatever the case may be, it's one, two, three strikes you're out for Aaron Maben as a Bill and in the league in 2009. Look at 2010. C.J. Spiller. I love C.J. Spiller. I wanted C.J. Spiller out of Clemson for the Washington Redskins. C.J. Spiller is a very dynamic back. When given space, one of the most lethal backs in the National Football League, he's finally getting to display his talents. Last year, finally going over 1,000 yards because he got the requisite carries necessary for him to show what he can do. Now I think he's ready to break out. Right now, he is a double, but he has the potential to ascend to another level. I could see C.J. Spiller easily being a triple in this league, but... Some big losses on that offensive line for the Bills. They're going to need to replace those in order for C.J. Spiller to pick up where he left off last season. But you look at 2011, Marcel Darius. Double. Solid defensive tackle. I don't think enough credit is given to him on that defensive line. This is a really good defensive line for the Bills. Could be better. Darius has played well. I want to see him do even better, though. I think there's more there. And I want to see Marcel Darius play even better on that defensive line for the Bills. But I think he's played well enough to warrant a double to this point. You look at Stephon Gilmore. Double. I like the way this young man has come in and played. He was thrust into the fire by the Bills. Cornerback out of South Carolina. Look, you're going to give up some plays when you're a rookie at the cornerback position. It's baptism by fire. You learn on the run. I thought Stephon Gilmore did a really good job in his rookie campaign of doing that. I like what I see out of him. He's a long, physical corner that can really run. I like Stephon Gilmore a lot. I think the future is very bright for him. It's a double for Stephon Gilmore at this time. So you look at the Bills draft picks, and in that 13-year span, they had some rough patches. They had some good selections. I didn't name any home runs, and that's the problem. No home runs, only one triple. Way more strikeouts than there are triples in home runs. That's the problem with the Bills. The inability to draft players well, that's number one. And when you do actually draft a guy that is decent, to hold on to them. Of this list of players, there might be five Bills left out of a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 15 bills. And I omitted one bill. Eric Wood was also drafted in that 09 draft with Mabin. He's a single right now. Injuries have really set him back. When healthy, he's a double easily. But Eric Wood often is injured. If he can stay healthy, I like Eric Wood at the center position. He's a single though. So you look at those 15 players and maybe five or six of those guys are still on the Bills roster to this day. That's a problem. You're not holding on to your draft picks. And they're not panning out. Either they're not panning out or you're not holding on to them. Either way, they're not still in Buffalo. That's a problem. Bills have to be better. Look at this group. They average out to a single. That's not good. You look at the number eight overall selection. That averages out to a double. You put the two together. You're talking about a solid single. The Bills cannot afford to draft a single. Another single at the number eight pick. It has to be a guard to me. You want a receiver, that would be nice. I don't think you have that luxury right now. You cannot forget your identity. What made the Bills a dangerous team last year was the ability to run the football with C.J. Spiller. 
No one was afraid of Ryan Fitzpatrick in the Bills passing game. They were afraid of C.J. Spiller in the Bills rushing attack. You lose Andy Levitri in free agency. You also lose Chad Reinhart in free agency. You have no guards on your football team. You need to get a guard at eight. And most likely, there is a chance one might be off the board at eight. But most likely, you'll have the pick of the litter. You'll have the pick of the best of the best, the creme de la creme in this draft. Take a guard. Make sure that you take a guard. I know you want to get a receiver. It'd be nice to get some other flashy position. You need to take substance here. Take a guard. I don't care if it's Jonathan Cooper or Chance Warmack. Take a guard. Plug him in where Levitri left and move on. Honestly, I think Jonathan Cooper fits better what you want to do. But if you want a mar, you want a downhill banger, then you go after Chance Warmack. You're looking for more of a agile and athletic guy that can get to the second and third level. You're looking for Jonathan Cooper. I think he's a better fit in Buffalo is Cooper, but it doesn't matter. If you're looking for a guy that can pass, protect, and run, then you take Chance Warmack. If you're looking for a guy that can be more agile in the run game, then take Cooper. Either way, take the guard. If you want to hit a home run, a triple, or at worst, a double, take the guard. You want to go for the big splash and you want to try to hit a home run, keep in mind, when you absolutely go for the home run, when you go up thinking home run, you can strike out very easily. When you go up and your approach is, look, I just want to make solid contact and whatever happens, happens. That's when the home runs occur. But when you go up thinking, I need a home run, that's when you go and strike out because you put too much pressure on yourself. Don't overthink this, Buffalo. At eight, you should be thinking guard, draft the guard, plug him in, let him play, and watch this guy turn into an absolute gem at eight and end up being a home run for you. And so history says it's supposed to be a single for you at eight. But if you're the Bills, it can't be a single. It won't be a single if you draft a guard. And that's going to do it for the Buffalo Bills in the draft game.